like we're, we're driving it's like it's packed outside on the roads on the streets like hella college students and and it's all basically all white people right all white people 20 percent black people and then you'll see the occasional indian dude but he'll be holding a sign that says like oh parking 100 dollars, parking 200 dollars, and they'll like be pointing to like a parking spot that they're managing right like they're just they're hustling everybody else is out here just like trying to entertain themselves and that's why indians are the richest people like by household average household income in the united states it's like okay that's also some npc shit if you really think about it but, and that's like the theme of this whole story time but like you see things like that and then it becomes like a why did indian people beat white people at their own game okay well this is why mysteries cleared up so we go in it took forever to get in too the game's about to start and we're like walking up the thing dude you could just stand by the side of the field on at like college games i'm so used to the mercedes-benz stadium over here in atlanta which is like so restrictive and it's like you really can't be close to the action at all but if you want to stand the whole time and you want to be like right up close to the players you could do that we're walking up the bleachers we're walking up the steps and they have on the jumbotron they have like the players being shown oh this player and that that player like comes out and everyone's like cheering for them and some players had like no cheers and some players had like the whole stadium cheering for them and I was like, oh shit, this is aura right here, bro. This is what that means. It was like the craziest disparity in aura I've felt in a long time. See, I got my own, I got NPC tendencies as well. I get it. I, I understand what's going on here. But like, man, people go so hard for this shit. Like, I feel it. I get it. But like, there's no reason to go this hard, dude. Life really is like super unserious when you really think about it. I was sitting next to Faraz actually for like half the game. I was sitting next to Faraz and, or standing, I guess, because you were basically standing the whole game. And during the opening ceremony, it was like, everyone had these like routines and everyone was like walking a certain way and, and all this stuff. And they pulled out the flags and then all the spinning things and then fireworks and all this stuff. And I told him, I'm like, I'm like, how many thousands of hours do you think went into this like manpower hours that they could have done like anything else with that they could have been like productive with like people are starving and they're like suffering and there's some dude probably not even far from like probably a mile away from here who's like crying his eyes out because like his life is falling apart and his apartment just got flooded and like from a leak or whatever and no one's responding and like all this stuff and he's sick and he has the flu and it's like bro people are like going through it and how many honestly i'm not even joking probably at least ten thousand hours of manpower went into just the opening ceremony there is no issue of like generating wealth or generating you know value of people or like it, it's just a matter of like people just not like people going like hey yo let's actually take this a little more seriously you know because this stuff seriously is it's so unserious man and i have no issue with that i i have an issue with when people get mad at the fact that i call out how stupid it is to care about this kind of stuff but as a conspiracy theorist actually there was this th this was the most like interesting most like memorable part of the whole thing which was i think like four jets flew over that was the first time i've ever seen that like in person dude that was a plata o plomo moment that was like a message to all the people like me who like think i don't want to get too conspiracy conspiracy tutorial or whatever but it was literally like the message was like be entertained consume our mindless entertainment or die but i don't want to read too much into it you know it's, we don't gotta get into that right now on this one. The game was, I mean, a lot of people said it was interesting. Georgia caught up near the end, but Georgia didn't win. It wasn't like a comeback. It wasn't that interesting of a game. I didn't really care about the game, honestly. But there was a personal foul, uh, unnecessary roughness offense, number 52, I think. And I wanted to see that. So I like put, put my glasses back on to like look at the Jumbotron to see the replay. And they didn't show that one. That was the only one I wanted to see. And that was the only one they didn't show. Also, apparently... QBs run a lot now like in the NFL as well I wasn't aware of this before because I haven't kept up with football in so long dude they were playing like how I used to play on Madden mobile 
They're just running like QB sneak, like, not QB sneak, but they're just like running all the time. It's just so weird to like, because I'm a creator more than I am a consumer from an artistic perspective, not a human perspective, obviously, not like a grander, like universal perspective. No one is more of a, con a creator than a consumer. Everything crashes and burns in the end, but I don't want to get, that's like a different philosophy. As a creator, I'm going in there and I'm noticing things like from a creator's perspective. Like when they had like the like the things on the screen on like the really thin like bar screen of like oh make noise make noise and it's like shaking and it's like doing this like after effects like bi really basic after effects like template of like earthquake motion or whatever I'm looking at that like dude I know exactly what they did to make this like I'm noticing these things because I'm a creator. This kind of stuff doesn't work if you're like a creative individual, but it worked on everyone there. It was like, it'd be kind of quiet for a second. And then they'd be like, oh, oh, we got to get everyone hype again. Get hype, get loud, whatever. Like, are people just gonna, they all listen to it, bro. They all like, if it said like, start edging, would they just do it, bro? I'm, I actually want to see how far they can push that. I'm like watching, like the thing is on the screen and then it starts shaking and then like the most obnoxious, stupid music starts like blasting and then i'm like oh okay let's see who's gonna stand up and like some people are sitting down and then like some dude just like gets up and it's like oh yeah yeah i'm like dude this is a religion this is a cult this is what they're they are submitting to their religion right now the whole time actually it was so loud i thought my phone was vibrating my pocket like repeatedly throughout the entire thing but nothing was going off because my phone is dry as fuck and i get no notifications but like the endorphin rush for a normie must have been crazy now that I'm thinking about it. Also, people in Bama have really trash taste in music. I mean, I guess people all around have really trash taste in music, but again, it's like I said, I have some NPC tendencies as well. I'm used to the music from around here. On a technical level, it's all trash music. I think if I had earplugs, it would have been a lot more fun actually, because I, I, I get the appeal. I really like how, I guess this is an attribute of all college games, I'm assuming, but it's way more intimate than NFL games. Cause like, this is like the, one of the first things I noticed. In NFL games, there's never a moment of quiet. It's always loud. People are always, like, you will bring their kids and their girl and they're having conversations with each other. All this stuff is like half the stadium's not even paying attention. People are walking around and all that stuff. But like, th they, these are like people that think that they're closely involved. And a lot of them are. A lot of them are like family friends who is friends with someone who is friends with someone who is friends with someone who is playing. Even being friends with someone who is playing doesn't actually matter all that much. Like the game itself is stupid, but there is so much more of an intimate, there's moments in the game where it just goes completely silent, where it's like, oh, this is a really hype moment. And you'll never get that in the NFL, bro. You'll never get that sitting in an NFL stadium, maybe in like a, in the most extreme scenario. But these are not extreme scenarios. And it was like, everyone was silent. It was like near pin drop silence. And I'm like, oh shit, we're all on the same page here. We're all invested in this moment to where we're all not gonna talk. And then immediately everyone gets hype again. And it was like loud. It was like, you feel like it's piercing through your chest, how loud it was, dude. It was actually like, it was actually a, a slightly painful how loud it was. I really should have brought earplugs. Crazy aura, dude. It was like a dangerous, like violent, like pito type of like intense, volatile aura. And then there's like, I mean, this is a pro or a con, depending on whether or not you're more of a creator or you're more of a mindless consumer, you know? And I guess there's like a, if you're just looking to get like a break from all this stuff from like the normal like world and all that, this is not how you do it. But if, if that's what you're looking for and you want to, stay off your phone, you just want to be invested in something, then I totally get that because it's like, you can't be on your phone in this. It's too loud. It's like, even when there's like some moment of silence or like the teams take a timeout or something like that and people will start like sitting down some more and everyone's like sort of calm down, they'll just start blasting some music. It's way too, you can't have a, you, you can't call anybody because there's such terrible like service, but it's so loud when they play music, you literally can't even have a conversation with the person next to you. Oh, and the cheerleaders were, were actually pretty mid, which is crazy because it's like, the whole time while we're there, like one out of 10 of those girls were straight up like a dime, like just girls like just walking around, like just sitting like uh, girls like in the college or like girls just like, with their man, like just walking around flawless. And then the cheerleaders are mid. I, I couldn't understand, it, it honestly didn't make much sense to me. Maybe they're like, I don't know, diversity hires or something. It's also crazy how obesity is the new normal. I don't spend so much time with normies 
So every time I see it like growing, it surprises me because it's not a gradual shift in my mind. But yeah, I mean like the random white blonde girl walking around like Barbie doll looking girl was like literally it, it was some of the most attractive white girls I've ever seen in my life. Um, and not a single one of them was on the cheer team. They, they weren't like attractive. I mean, they were conventionally attractive from the outside, but like you, you look at them for literally like 10 seconds and you're like, all right, I know you're disgusting on the inside. Dude, whenever the, the Jumbotron would show, like the camera would go onto any like group of girls or whatever, there, it was like, it's become so normal at this point to like be fake for a camera. It's become so normal that like nobody even judges it anymore. It's just like how things are done. It's like a part of, you should have seen it, man. You should have seen it. Like the girls, I, I can't even do an impression of it. I don't know how to, they're so good at it, dude. They're actually so good at faking it. Oh yeah, yeah, like with their arms over the bars or whatever, and they'll see themselves in the Jumbotron and they'll, oh yeah, like like immediately start dancing and like pretend, like who are you dancing for, dude? How, how does this keep happening after all these years? Like, do people not, there are people falling for this? Are like guys seeing girls on the screen and going like, ooh, ooh, I like her. I'm gonna talk to her at the after party or whatever, or like at this bar, after, I'm gonna try to look for, like, what are they even thinking in their minds? Like, did you not see the fact that she was just like bored out of her mind just a second ago? And then the moment she sees she's on camera, she's like fake dancing, fake smiling, fake all this stuff. It's like, how is it attractive to you, dude? How does this work? How is this a strategy that people continue to use? And this speaks to like the much larger issue of like the envy basilisk of to it, it, people lying to others in order to lie to themselves in order to convince themselves of something that's not true, which is that they're having fun because people are not having fun because comparison is the thief of joy because they look at other girls on social media and they go, oh, they're having so much more fun than me. And because they don't wanna call out those girls, which I literally tell them, I'm like, you know how you can fix the world if girls just called out other girls and held each other accountable? Or they'd let guys hold girls accountable, which they don't, which they refuse to do. Cause that's uh, apparently not empowering or whatever, or that's restrictive and girls can do whatever they want. Even, even if it ruins them. But literally it's like, we're all human beings. It, girls, guys, doesn't matter. We're all susceptible to this. If you're having a certain amount of fun and it's real fun and you would have that fun and you would enjoy it. You see somebody on social media having more fun than you. It will ruin your fun, at least to a certain extent. And then in order to come up, feel the need to step on their shoulders, but that's not how that works. That's not how the, the reality situation works. Happiness comes from giving and from uplifting and from pulling others up. You can only attract others with your energy. So if you're trying to push somebody down to like step on their shoulders, to go like to pretend to have fun, because that's what this is. This is all pretending. You're pretending like faking it so you make it so that you can convince yourself in your own mind that it's real. Instead of like actually enjoying yourself, it's just people like sitting there bored and then they're like, they get on the camera and now it's like, oh, I'm having fun, I'm having fun. And then they're back to being bored. You're just pretending. It's just a, it's a competition for Instagram. It's just a competition to see who can convince other people that they're actually having the most fun. Because maybe, you know, and, and this is me giving them as much credit as possible and trying to like um, um, assume that they're not actually just straight up evil. It's being straight up evil is just trying to convince other people like to be jealous. I'm saying they're doing it indirectly because they themselves want to be happy. They themselves actually want to have fun and they want to convince themselves that they're having fun. So they kind of step over others to go like, hey, look how much fun I'm having. But really, we are all pull forces. We are all forces of attraction, especially girls, especially those with the force of the feminine that, that overtake their entire lives. Whether you know it or not, if you are trying to make another girl feel jealous, you are pulling them down towards you. You have to be below them. True happiness comes from giving. True happiness comes from feeling so blessed that you feel the need to give to others, that you feel the need to share your happiness with others and, 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 and pray for them and pray that they receive the same luck and, and blessings and fortune that you have gotten in your life. But that's not what this is. This is literally, it's a, it's a competition and it's a, it's a vicious cycle. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy and it gets worse and worse and worse over time and no one's doing anything about it because even all the dudes over there are just a bunch of fucking losers. And I can get into that. And I will. First of all, I remember seeing people in the nosebleeds, like people who couldn't afford like a proper ticket or like an expensive ticket. Because the tickets were expensive, I think. I don't know, I didn't pay for them, but I would assume they would be. There's like a couple hundred people in the nosebleeds. Like, don't you have money to make? Like, what are you doing, dude? Don't you have an adventure to go on? 
Don't you have things to do? There's like no lights, it's cold, it probably smells bad, you can barely see the action. Like what's even the point, honestly? Like how could you want to be part of something so badly yet have such a little capacity to like be a part of it that like, I mean, is there a life, you know, some people will just amount to nothing, I guess. Okay, sitting in the sands is honestly not even as bad as watching watching the game like on TV, on a streaming platform, whatever. I was actually at a Shane Gillis um, comedy show recently and he made a joke about, about football. He was like, something along the lines of like, it's crazy the fact that like 50 year old men will spend thousands of hours of their lives watching like a bunch of teenagers play with balls. And I was thinking about that. I'm like, the dude in front of me is like balding. He's like a white, he had white hair too. He had like gray hair. He's like standing up and sitting down and like getting involved in the game. And he was alone too. It looked like it. And I'm like, don't you have a life or something? I don't know, just uh, just random random thoughts I had during the... Man, I really gotta stop doom scrolling, huh? Um, what else, what else? At one point there was a uh, sponsor that showed up on the thing called Hiller. And I thought it said Hitler at first. I really gotta stop doom scrolling, bro. Speaking of Hitler, Donald <laughs> Trump showed up to the game. I shouldn't have transitioned it like that, but whatever. Oh my god, I actually, I really don't want to get go in on this. But I'm gonna do it, because I said I would like, I'm, I'm about to expose the whole thing, dude. Because like, people will give me shit, like, in conversations about politics or whatever, it, I'll like, defend Donald Trump at, at things, right? And people will give me shit for that. Because I'm defending him like how I would any normal human being. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt that I would a human being, you know? And they'll like, just shit on him they'll just hate on him constantly right but then when he shows up to the game they don't treat him like a human being they they go like oh we uh do you think we can talk to this connection so we can like get closer so we can like take a selfie with him or something like that the same people bro the same people that are shitting on him and i'm like dog he's just a human being the whole time i'm not shitting on him or glazing him either one because he's just a human I'm, I'm just shooting him like a normal person bro like why are you why are you trying to argue with me? You're the one that's switching up your energy. It's like drama, like on the car ride there, they're like, oh my God, did you see that this this person that we knew on Facebook like 20 years ago managed to get a picture with him? Oh, that's, that's crazy, that's insane. How did that even happen? It's like, what do you, like, how is this news to you? Why are you putting this guy on such a pedestal that you're just like hoping and like praying like, Please, Donald Trump, let me leech like a crumb. Just a, just some scraps. Please give me some aura. Please give me some some clout. Please, oh please, oh please. And and I would say I'm surprised, like, I and I am surprised every time I see it because I'm like, damn, you don't learn, you don't have like a learning curve. It took me being 16 to go from being a normie and hating Donald Trump, to when I was 16, also realizing, oh shit, nah, all these people are like flawed humans, you know? All of them are. It's like, dude, you're you're 28 years old and you still haven't figured that out? You're like taking a, a Snapchat story from like the other side of the stadium of like another human being who you've never even met and you will never meet in your life? I don't have a problem, I don't necessarily have a problem with like people devoting attention to someone that is impactful on their lives, right? But it's like the switch up in energy from like, oh yeah, he's such a he racist and problem with America and all this stuff. But then the moment he shows up, you're like leeching, glazing, all this stuff like, oh, let me, oh, there's someone on such a hype. No wonder you hate him actually. No wonder these people hate Donald Trump because they're submissive to him. That makes so much sense. He occupies so much space in their minds. They think about him. I don't think about the guy, bro. I actually, honestly, dude, I feel kind of sorry for people who hate Donald Trump. I'd be mad too. I'd, I'd like to be submissive to, to some dude who you will never meet, who, is, who doesn't care about you, who you shouldn't care about either. When CNN tells you to like, look this way, oh, this person is doing something bad and you just, you just can't help but look, Simon says, CNN says, so they tell you, ah, orange man bad, and you go, orange man bad. You just can't resist. You can't resist. You never built up that mental strength to be able to go like, hmm, are you sure? Really? Are you sure there's not more nuance to it? You never developed that. That's like a real skill, actually, if you think about it. It's not like such a hard skill to learn, but it's like they don't teach it. And I feel sorry for the people that like, honestly, I feel like a lot of people are scared of Donald Trump. They're scared of what he could do. They're scared of the power that they could... That, that he could end up with. And um, 
Couldn't be me. I can't relate, dude. I'm not scared of nobody. My problem comes when people like start hating on me for it, you know? Like, bro, I'm giving you the chance to like j join me, dude. Join me in in being on his level. He's a human being just like me. I said it earlier. I'm like, I'm like, bro, I could beat Donald Trump in a lot of these debates. And they're like, oh, really? Like, what are you? They're like, listening to what I'm saying. They're like, oh, that's oh bold statement. I'm like, wait, you can't? Why are you treating this guy like he's like beyond human, dude? Treat him like he's human. Watch what that does for your self-esteem. When you stop treating these people like they're gods, you stop idolizing these people like false gods, false idols, dude. I'm not shitting on anyone. I'm offering you the opportunity to join me in this attitude of let's take ourselves a little more seriously than this, right? I'm, I'm giving something. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful, nigga. Froze always wants to oversimplify the world, bro. He'll like ask family members like, oh, no, no, no. What about the colonial stuff? Like he'll like ask like really leading questions to like get the answers he's looking for. Always like, bro, it's more complicated than that. When we're talking about India, we're Indian, by the way. Uh, or at least our parents are from India. And it's like, oh, oh who can we blame for for India's, you know, poor economy? Oh, the British? Oh, okay, the white people, there's an example. I ah, got them. And they're the villains of society, so absolutely we can blame them. Even though they're the minority in the grand scheme of the entire world, they're, they're the majority and we should hate on them, you know? It's like, bro, the British are actually partially responsible for the success of India. But, you know, again, it's more complicated than that. It always is more complicated than that. He'll, he'll like, ask a really leading question, and then he won't even... He'll be like really blatant about it. He'd be like, yeah, that's th actually, that's like the answer I was looking for, actually. Like he just straight up admits like he was looking for a specific answer. I remember my my grandfather was like saying, because he lived in India, so he was saying good things about the British uh, about that time, some stories and things like that. And my brother was like disgusted. Like he, he takes in that information, information that comes from the same source that, that if they said what he wanted to hear, he'd be like, oh yeah, I have the source, totally legit. And he'd use that to reinforce his worldview. But he's like disgusted. And, and my, I remember my, he literally said, my brother literally said, this is basically a direct quote, but I may have gotten a couple words wrong, but the essence is the same. He literally said, I can't believe the first words that came out of his mouth when talking about British people were good things. What the, f what? Why can't the first words when talking about any kind of people be good things? We're all people. Literally in that same conversation, it was like, it was near the end of the conversation, they were talking about like where for us to travel and they're like, oh, you should go to Europe, you should go to Europe, you should go to these countries. He's like, oh, I don't, I don't really like uh, Western Europe. There's no culture in Western Europe. He literally said there's no culture in Western Europe. This place that has like 10,000 years of history and culture. He's like, oh, there's no culture. There's, there's more culture in Eastern Europe, but there's no culture in Western Europe. He literally said that. He has no concept of the fact that like, True culture exists among individuals. True culture is made when you're like, you and your friends create traditions to like go to this restaurant and talk to like, in the way that you guys operate. It's like culture is made on, on small scales and even culture as a whole. This is a different kind of video that I'll make a topic on later, but cultural like labels and stuff like that is, is actually fake. It's actually not real. It's, a, it's an illusion. Um, it's a substitute, it's a void for a lack of identity. And because my generation and his generation as well has an identity crisis, they feel the need to fill this void. And when someone threatens that, they go, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong. But you're filling your identity with something that's not real. It's only like at most 1% of your identity can be your culture. That's it. You're forgetting like all the things that make up who you are. And then there's the culture. Because if you were born in a different culture, then you would be that. That's not actually you. The things you do as a part of your like traditions and all that stuff, that's not actually you. That's just your environment. That's just the way you're responding to it. But your influence over it, not your submissiveness, but your dominance, your basedness, your your own original ideas, your own like desires of how you want things to go, and your impact, your ability to change the game, to bend it to your will, that's who you are. And if the majority of like things you can use to describe yourself are like things that cultural things, things that are a part of your culture, you really don't have much of an identity. And if you're, you're traveling and the highlights of your travel are like, oh, I got to experience this culture and this culture and this culture, 
you're really not experiencing much life at all. You're not going into any depth or like really learning about anyone at all. Because the majority, there's good and bad and and amazing stories and, and character arcs and all this stuff to be found everywhere you go, in every single person on the planet, at all times, past, present, and future, all ages, all two genders, every country, everyone. But he's very prideful because, you know, he's one of these people that doesn't have very much of an identity. So he, like, tries to fill it. He, he finds a lot of pride in, like, oh, the Indian GDP was so strong back then before the white people came and it's like, again, that's also way more complicated. And then, and then he's like, oh, did you know that, like, he says this to, like, everyone, dude. He's like, Christopher Columbus, as if people don't already know this, Christopher Columbus was coming, he came to America looking for India. Which, again, that's also more complicated. Oh, and, you know, they called him Indians because he called them Indians. Which, by the way, that's also more complicated than that. That's actually not entirely true. He doesn't have something inside him that he can point to to justify his existence in the world. He doesn't have something where he can go, yes, this is why I'm needed. This is why I deserve to live. So he has to like prop himself up with this like pride, this like genetic superiority, like showing off his culture. Oh, look how cool Indians are. Look how great Indians are. I don't need that. I know I belong on this earth. I know I deserve it. I know I'm worth something. Because I, I, I peer into my own mind and I'm like, I'm one of I'm one of the ones. I'm one of the ones who is responsible for keeping humanity alive. I'm one of the ones, if this was ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million years ago, they would look to someone like me in times of need. I'm one of them. I'm I'm a true I'm an artist. I'm a fool and I know I'm a fool. In every population, from from the most advanced society in the world to the uncontacted tribes, there are those who stand out. There are those people who, who go on the extreme, people who push the boundaries, and I'm one of them. I belong here. I'm needed. Without me, this whole ship sinks. And anyone could be that. He could be that too. He has great artistic potential, more than I have, but he just refused to to let that potential be manifested. The culture he appreciates is shallow and an illusion. It's not real. When, when I travel, I do it so I can meet people to understand their character that comes from their personal experiences, not to listen to the script they've been told to recite because of the color of their skin or the letters on their passports. I have this like great, great analogy for it. And it's from Catching Fire, uh, the second Hunger Games book. There's a new Hunger Games book coming out, but, um, and I'm pretty sure there's gonna be a movie that comes along with it. But there's this point where Katniss is like getting ready to go into the Hunger Games again, right? And the people on her team, like Octavius and them, and like Lily and uh, whatever, whatever the names were, they all like develop such a strong attachment to her and they're like they're like crying and all that stuff over the fact that she has to like go back into the arena that's like hurting katniss right she just wants to like not think about it she doesn't want any like emotional baggage or whatever she's disgusted at these people from the capital who like who never learned how to be strong for somebody else I think that's how she worded it. It's like, and she literally was disgusted because she's like, I'm the one that has to console them. I'm the one going in to die. But again, you got to realize what kind of book it is and the kind of target demographic. It's a, it's a marketed towards teenage girls. They don't have empathy. They didn't develop it yet. Empathy is realizing that like Katniss is no better than them. She has no right to be disgusted at them because it's their experiences who made them. That's why I'm like talking shit about for us here because it's like, there's nothing, it's so it's so easy to disrespect it. In fact, it's actually very difficult to respect it because it's like he never learned that empathy is taking the effort to look deep, like the character that's hidden deep within someone past all the indoctrination that they've been given because of the arbitrary identities they have. Oh, you're from this country. Oh, you have this skin color. Oh, you're this religion or whatever, you know? But it's their sense of humor and their ambitions and their morality and their ability to love all of these things are so much more meaningful 
than a culture, I'll be honest, a big a culture that's big, a culture that is ubiquitous, a culture that you that makes life easier. Because if you can go around and tell someone, tell any random person on the street, oh, I'm a part of this culture, I'm black, I'm white, I'm whatever. Your culture is too big, it is too vague, you're part of a team that's too large to have any real, like, meaningful anything, and it's just a way for people to, like, stay safe. Oh, let's let's make the nest bigger, as big as we can possibly make it, and expand our culture and, and share our prosperity, like, like, Fire Lord Sozin type philosophy. And it's the rejection of, like, let's create great things that maybe won't last very long, but let's do it for the fun of it. Let's do it for the process and not care so much about the product and not care so much about the end result. It's it's immortality. It's evil. It's literally evil to propagate, to prop up, to to support these any culture that has a name that is so big, like that you can literally name it, that the, a common person can name what it is. It's immoral to, to prop up those cultures, to give them any more power than they already have. And then that creates the vicious cycles. That's what creates even less true secure identity and, and gives you the option, hey, you can latch onto this insecure thing. We can make you more addictive, more submissive, more disconnected from other people, more reliant on this fake culture than, than the people around you that you love. That's why he drinks and I don't. That's why he smokes and I don't. That's why he cannot control himself around growth. That's why he can't go 10 seconds without some sort of stimulation listening to music or something like that. It's why he can't think deeply and actually like use his brain because someone handed him a script and said, Hey, if you don't know what to say in conversations and you just want to have a good conversation rather than actually be real, just say this script, preface it, pick the right script. Indian, this age, th this religion. Make sure you pick the right script for you and then you'll have everything you have to say. I looked at the script and I'm like, nah, I'm good. I'm good, I'll come up with it myself. Even if I'm bad at it, I'll do it anyways. Because if it's a thing that's worth doing, it's worth doing badly as well. And again, I don't have a problem with NPCs, right? I mean, th there is the deeper problem, which is like, you really don't know how to have fun as an NPC. The real fun, actually, when it comes to traveling, is finding people who reject their culture. Is finding people who go against the grain and who will secretly be a bit of an outcast to their society if they let it be known and you can peel back the layers on them and like find their true characters. That's where the real fun and the real story and the real depth actually comes from when traveling. But that's not like, that's a problem we can deal with when it arrives. My problem is like, dude, don't act all self-righteous to me as if your approach is better than mine. And notice how the, all these all these like liberals have to always say like, oh, real culture, real culture, never bad culture. Because if they just blatantly outright said it like the way they think it, which is like, Oh, white people have a bad culture. If they said that, then it would open the door to a conversation. And that's not a conversation they want to have because then it can be disproven. Then white people can go, actually, no, we don't have a bad culture. But they have to say it in a way where it can't be disproven. They go, oh, but that that thing, that's like exactly like what, no, but that's not real. And I'll be straight with you, bro. Where I'm from, where I live, the place I am at right now, straight up the worst culture right here around here is black culture. It, it, straight up. And any, any person, black or not, with a brain will admit that. And you know what? That's the exact one that he defends the most. Because he's not a dreamer. He does not see it as possible to be both like good, like ethical, and successful in the same lifetime. But I see it, I see a way, I see a path forward. But it has to be done together. I it can't do it alone. It has to be me and, and, and other people like me who are willing to create this world around us, this world that doesn't yet even exist. This is what it means to be an artist. This is what it means to be a visionary, to have a vision. I remember in that in that conversation, this whole thing, this whole time I'm talking about it, we were at like a, a breakfast like the next day. And he was telling these people, these other family members, he's like, oh, you guys should go to Mexico City. My brother literally says, it's like New York City, but with more culture. And they asked him, they asked him, oh, have you ever been like to Mexico City? And he goes, no. What, what the hell are you picking sides for? For like, I know what you're picking sides for because you don't have an identity, but. For us, it treats travel like it's a to-do list. It's like, ah, the mainstream told me I will find this check that one off the list. The mainstream also told me I should feel proud of my skin color. Check that one off the list. Like, you think about it, he really actually hasn't, like, 
explored any place he's ever even been to or lived. He hasn't even explored Atlanta. And this all might sound unrelated. I probably should have prefaced all this with like, I'm gonna tie it all back. But like halfway through the game, it's like me, Faraz, Oez, Oez's little brother who goes to school there. And we're like just chilling over there, like in like the concessions area or whatever. And there's some dude that's like walking by. If you really think about it, I don't even wanna explain this one. I can explain this one in more in depth later. But if you really think about it, rooting for a sports team, it's stupid. It, it, it is the same logic that drives racism. Like if you get heated about sports teams, then in a different life, or maybe in that life, you would be racist. So it's you particularly that's the problem. It's not the race that's the problem. If people go like, oh, it's white people that's racist, but then a black person is really, really deep into sports and he really gets invested in sports, then if that black person just happened to have white skin, they would be considered a racist white person and they would follow the same logic and they would be racist because it's the same logic that drives the two. Because this guy walks by and he's like, they're, they're all Alabama fans and he's like, oh, fuck Georgia, whatever, because we're like wearing the shirts and all that stuff. They're drunk, so it actually starts to get a little bit heated. And then Faraz comes out of the bathroom for like the fifth time and Faraz is super drunk. I hate taking care of him when he's drunk, dude. And and he's like, oh, what is this guy, what is this guy saying? What's going on over here? And he like shows up. And he's like, he's, what, he's saying something racist. He's, saying, he's like automatically assumes that. And actually I'm thinking a bit more nuanced here because like on one hand, you could like any reasonable person, a sober person would go like, no, Faraz, he's not saying anything racist. Like, shut up. Why, are, why is that the first thing that comes to your mind? Why is that automatically your assumption? You know the analogy of like the white girl in the elevator with her purse and then the black guy walks in the elevator and then the white girl starts like clutching her purse even more now that the black guy's in there. And the black guy's thinking like, well, I wasn't gonna do anything, but like now you're like, it, like uh, now that, why would you even assume that, you know? Why are you even expecting, why are you expecting the worst of me? Why are you not giving me the chance to even like start off on a good foot with you, you know? You're doing the same thing. You're automatically assuming that like, if they're gonna talk about you, like if they're gonna talk shit, then they're automatically gonna start off as something racist. And that's like a reasonable take to have, but I've already thought about this before. And it's like, dude, it is racism. It is caring about the team like that and going like, fuck your team and like getting heated about it. That's the same logic. It's the same, like, what's the difference? Why take one seriously and one not seriously? Why go like, oh, is he saying something racist about us? And they go like, no, nah, no. Nah. He's just shitting on the place that we that we live in and that we come from for no particular reason, even though he doesn't even know any of us and doesn't know any and even though half the team of half the team on Alabama is literally from Georgia, he's just saying fuck Georgia. And he goes like, Oh, oh, okay, okay. That's no big deal. Because for some reason they taught you that this is serious, but this is not serious, and this you can have rivalries over, but this you should take it like it's like war. It's literally just stupidity. This is why I'm, I'm tying it all back to this because it's like my brother's the typical sports fan. He will watch football, he will watch basketball, he'll get invested in all this stuff and he is the exact tar target demographic they're looking for. Pure, brain dead NPC, no matter how much I try to help him break out of it, he just refuses to. And that really is the moral of the story. It's like, if you're a submissive person already, like my brother, then like, don't watch sports. It's gonna make you even more submissive, especially something like American football. And I'll, I have to say American in front of it every single time because more people know the word football as like the real football. So if you can come up with a better name for American football, then do it. Until then, that's what I'm gonna call it. It's a submissive, it's an NPC sport. And like, a lot of people are fooled by it. And even me as well. I. I I fall into it, I understand it, because it's a very high aura sport. Very, very high aura, especially compared to a lot of the other sports. But like, that's like falling into someone's domain expansion who's stronger than you. Like, don't fall for it, dude. You see like everyone on the street wearing the same color and you go like, ooh, I wanna wear that color too. It's like, no, dude. What the hell are you doing wearing another dude's jersey? Even the players are NPCs. Like for the most part, right? Of course there's real people to be found in every setting but they're they're a rarity and and even in every setting the majority of people even the people at the highest level of whatever endeavor will still be npcs like i mean they probably have a, a like a greater ratio they're on the field like okay may the best man win you know and shaking hands and all this stuff and it's like a grand story playing out in their mind so they're they're like really they're they're experiencing life like that you know but it is like at the end of the day 
them just fooling themselves. It is like straight up it, the the numbers and the colors and all this stuff. The game, at, when you really dig deep down, is just business. There is a certain kind of beauty and tragedy both in like, oh, this is actually interesting. Where like your 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 life is kind of planned out for you, as like a pro player. Like from birth, you're kind of, not from birth, but you know what I mean. You're kind of sent to the slaughter, basically. You're kind of put to work, like to do this labor, to be entertainment, to be like a circus clown, basically, but with more respect and more fear. But you're a servant, you're a slave to, so that you can earn $20 million and you can collect $5 million of that. Uh, but then the remainder of the money goes to like rich executives in suits basically actually you don't even a student I mean you're gonna earn that from like other things if you're smart as a student you can earn quite a few million dollars but like most of them are not gonna earn that and you technically can't get paid as a student athlete a student athlete is just another word for slave the only difference is now they they also come in white now all of these things at the end of the day really are illusions you can't use like external games even to solve internal problems they definitely have it good i'm not saying they have it bad but you be an absolute fool of a football player college or any anything else pro of any kind if you try to convince yourself that you weren't just a pig sent out to the slaughter you weren't just an investment by your parents and by your community so that they can get rich You'd be a fool to convince yourself that the people who put you in that position actually love you. Because this is, it's like I said, culture is so meaningless compared to like real individual shit. And it's in the same way, it's like the competitive play of college American football or even the NFL even. A little bit less so, I would say. Or a little bit more so depending on how you look at it. Depending on like what you're playing for, you know, legacy and all this stuff and playing with friends and all that. It genuinely is such, such a meaningless endeavor compared to like all the other things in life that like make life what it is like just playing even playing casually with your friends just throwing the football around at sunset or like hustling and like making money and going on that journey or or like uh starting a family having kids or traveling and then there's like like you can blur the line i'm really into cars you could say that's like a that's npc behavior on my part i, I would try to convince you because I truly believe that like American football is is nothing is such a meaningless endeavor compared to like being interested in playing the game of cars, racing, building, all that stuff. But like even just like cooking, co like the culinary arts, like the, there's so many more like much more meaningful endeavors in life. And like I get the like if you enjoy it, you enjoy it, cool, go ahead watch, do all that stuff. But if you let it eat into your time when you have other things you should be worried about, you have like physiological needs to worry about, you want to make more money, you have goals in life. And you're like out here, like remembering the names of players, like playing fantasy, betting on this stuff and all that straight up, you're a loser. And especially for like American football in particular, I would say honestly, like that's a particularly more than average submissive, like NPC sport. You're really not using your brain when you get into that sport. You're really just watching what you're told to watch. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That was the whole, that's the story of the game. Also, they had camera, they had like steel cables or whatever. And like camera systems like mounted, like hanging from them. Dude, those are sick cameras. That's some, I want that kind of camera gear, bro, with that stabilization. But yeah, moral of the story is, um, there was an ad like halfway through the game. And it was like some sports gambling app. And it was like, Oh yeah, the game means so much more. Like make the game more meaningful. The game means more when you're betting on it, when you when you're investing money in it. And it's like moral of the story, the game shouldn't mean more. The game should mean as little as possible. It is a meaningless endeavor. If you're finding meaning in it, then you're sacrificing meaning in things that actually have the potential to have it. You you you're choosing to get into this rather than investing your time in other things. And and it's painful to let go of this because you fall into this cycle of like of having so little that you feel so desperate to to hold on to it because you're, you're already in so much pain of like having such little identity such little like things that mean anything in your life that you're like oh this thing means so little. it's like no if you let go of it you will find much more meaningful things in life don't do things to try to make the game more meaningful it's not a meaningful game 
And if you're able to like use that to fill the void in your life, you don't have much of a life. 